Chennai, the political and cultural capital of Tamil Nadu, is one of the fastest growing cities in India. But the rapid urbanization and real estate boom has brought challenges to the heritage buildings in the city. The Chennai metropolitan area is home to more than 400 heritage sites ranging from the 6th century Pallava era Parthasarathi temple at Tiruvallikeni to the numerous Art Deco style buildings built in the 1940s. Chennai or Madras as it was once known was one of the three most important cities in British India, the other two being Bombay and Calcutta. In the early 17th century, the famed textiles of the Coromandel coast drew traders from Europe who built trading outposts here. In 1644, the British acquired a banana grove from a man named Madrasan and built Fort St. George there, next to which emerged the settlement of Madras Patnam. Over time, as the population grew, a new settlement known as Chennai Patnam, named after a local governor, Chennappa Nayaka, was established. Over time, Madras became the economic hub of South India. The increased prosperity led to the construction of some of the iconic buildings in the city, such as the Chipok Palace, the High Court, Egmore Museum, commercial buildings on Mount Road and the numerous bungalows that once dotted the city. The first few decades after India's independence led to a wave of modernization in which numerous historic and heritage buildings were pulled down and replaced with high-rises. One of the greatest losses was the destruction of the historic Spencer's Plaza in a fire in 1983. It was the destruction in a fire and the subsequent demolition in 1985 of the historic Indo-Sarasanic style Moor Market that served as a catalyst for heritage activism in Chennai city. In the 1990s, several laws relating to heritage protection were passed. While these laws have stopped the rampant destruction of heritage structures, the pressures of urbanization meant that the threat to these buildings never really went away. Sujata Shankar, convener for Intax Chennai chapter, who has been working to raise awareness about Chennai's heritage, shares her perspective on why there is a general state of apathy towards heritage in the city and its solutions. The thing about it is also that we, our lives are entwined on a day-to-day -day basis with all of this heritage. And um, that also leads to you know, a certain apathy. It's a problem of plenty and you take it for granted. It's all around you and, you know, parallelly development is taking place. New buildings are coming up. Um, do you really pay respect to the heritage building that's in your neighborhood or in the vicinity? Or are you creating something else which ignores this? Um, I mean, either uh, new styles are fine, but are the, the buildings or the heritage of the past being respected while development and further construction is taking place? This is the question that, you know, sort of bothers us. And uh, there are various reasons why, you know, there is this apathy. Um, mostly in schools, you know, you're taught history, but are you really even taught a little bit of local history? I don't think so. And um, children are completely unaware of their local history. Uh, they learn history as if it is somebody else's. So that is a very big problem. And through awareness programs at Intac, we try to you know, make them aware of local history. And uh, we brought out this documentary called The Story of Madras, which narrates the you know, history of the city and the narration is done by no less than Mr. S. Muteya, who is known as the father of the heritage movement in Madras. 
So uh, we we're trying our best to sensitize children to the local history of Madras. For example, there's the Battle of Adyar, which just happened down the road. Uh, you know where the Adyar River um, comes down and meets the ocean near the estuary. But how many people even know that that there was a Battle of Adyar? So all these aspects we are unaware of, and therefore. If you're aware of it, you respect for the area, for the precinct, for the monuments and heritage that stand for those incidents will all grow exponentially. So I think it's very important to sensitize the younger generation. In the year 2006, the Madras High Court set up a committee under Justice E. Padmanabhan to look into the issue of heritage buildings. In its report submitted to the High Court, the committee listed 467 heritage buildings in Chennai which needed to be protected. Two years later, in 2008, the second master plan for the city was approved by the Tamil Nadu government and special rules for conservation of heritage buildings or precincts came into force. And finally, in the year 2012, the Chennai Municipal Development Authority or CMDA published a draft of 164 heritage buildings that needed protection. The Tamil Nadu Heritage Commission Act was passed and that was something that we all looked forward to and it would really give you know, protection to all the heritage in the state. While the legislative portion has been passed, uh, which now is almost a decade ago, but the operational part that is putting a committee in place to actually make this functional has not yet been done. The committee has not yet been formed. So this is something which is very worrisome and we have written to the government and one hopes that this will be formed soon and uh, this could even be one of the reasons why some of the heritage which is on the list is also disappearing. Um, we need to be really vigilant and uh, you know, cautious when it comes to protection of heritage. While the Archaeological Survey of India and the Tamil Nadu State Archaeological Department have their own set of listed monuments, a vast majority of Chennai's heritage buildings are privately owned. The lack of incentives for private owners to maintain these buildings and lucrative real estate prices have meant that the owners are often tempted to demolish these structures. What is needed is a robust monitoring mechanism and a system of incentives. A very stringent monitoring system from the government would be required because if it is declared heritage, Yes, they've sent out letters to the owners to ask them to uh, make applications in case of any modification, etc. But what about if somebody's without informing, demolishing them? That is where the danger lies. We have sent a letter to both CMDA and to the Corporation of Madras, that is the GCC, Greater Chennai Corporation, asking them to alert us and to also be alert themselves if any sanction for demolition comes up to please verify with the heritage list whether any of these fall within the purview of the heritage list. So some of the monuments, uh, some of the heritage buildings that have disappeared, we don't know how that happened. And um, the archeological uh, survey both the central and the state, they have protected monuments. So what we are talking about is what does not fall in that list. So we are talking about unprotected heritage, heritage which deserves protection, but is in the unprotected realm, which you know neither falls in the state protected category nor in the central government protected category. Those are mostly, you know, monuments and uh, HRNC looks after the temples, but there's a vast and varied heritage out there that is 
unprotected. And this is what we're talking about. And uh, when we're talking about protecting heritage, it's not only the building and what it stands for, but the materials and the skills that went into building them, which today may not be found. Sometimes the materials are no longer available. Sometimes the skill is no longer available. It's been passed on through generations. But as you know, with the you know, kind of commercialization that's happening globally and very much so in India, many of these skills like you know, lime workers or stone workers or terracotta workers, their children are not necessarily following those professions. They're going into some other you know, clerical jobs or IT jobs or coming to the city and these skills may be lost forever if we do not protect them. Fort St. George in the heart of Chennai is the kernel around which the city grew. Being a seat of power and authority for the entire Madras presidency for 200 centuries, the fort has numerous historic buildings within it. Even today, it houses the Legislative Assembly of Tamil Nadu, along with numerous other official buildings such as the Office of the Chief Minister. Many of the buildings within the Fort St. George, which, you know, are with multiple owners, there also you have the army, the government, uh, the Tamil Nadu government, then you have uh, the navy. There are various uh, stakeholders there. So it's very hard to take decisions, I think. And that could be one of the reasons why many of the structures are not being protected and um, it's one of the very important aspects of Madras history uh, that in 1639, the Fort St. George was established after which the British, uh, you know, sort of uh, stronghold happened uh, to spread in Chennai and in surrounding areas. So, uh, for example, if you look at the house of Arthur Wellesley, who went on to become the Duke of Wellington, uh, it's in a shambles totally and needs uh, a lot of, I would say, reconstruction because a lot of it has fallen apart, as also many of the other houses and homes. Um, that really requires to be looked into. In fact, uh, it was Mr. Mutea's dream that that would be declared a UNESCO World Heritage Precinct. Um, but different structures are in different states of preservation. And um, one uh, amazing example within the fort is the Clive House. Um, it was occupied as a residence by Robert Clive. And then it was used for entertainment by Edward Clive. It was the Admiralty Courts. It was a town hall. It had various functions and over 300 years, it has been a living and breathing building, and today it houses the offices of the Archaeological Survey of India. And it stands testimony to the fact that if you keep a building occupied and just simply open and close windows and do basic sweeping, mopping, and maintenance, and uh, spot any you know follies immediately, like if there's a leak on the terrace or if the plant is growing, attend to it immediately. A building like that, built 300 years ago in brick and lime, has survived all the vagaries of nature and of time. And it's a great testimony to the fact that heritage can be long-lasting if there is human will. Another important heritage building that is in great danger is the Bharat Insurance Building on Mount Ro or Anna Selai built in 1897. Owned by the Life Insurance Corporation of India, there was a plan to demolish the building in 2006. Intac filed a public interest litigation in the Madras High Court against the demolition, and the court in a landmark judgment in 2010 included the building in a set of 400 plus heritage structures that could not be demolished. But there have been successful examples of the restoration of heritage buildings in the city. The most notable example being the beautifully restored Senate House of the University of Madras. We've had uh, 
the Madras University Senate House, which you know was sort of deteriorating over time. Um, it was used as the examination hall and for various public events, there have been great speeches delivered there by leaders. There have been conferences of the Music Academy held there. So it was a hall of great importance. And that restoration came up um, about 20 years ago and Intac had the fortune of uh, restoring it back to its glory. Um, I would say brick by brick, part by part, uh, you know, the canvases of the ceiling were painted um, and um, all the brickwork was restored, the stonework was looked into, etc. cetera. Um, it today is not in as great a state of preservation, but if it is put back into use, recently there was a, you know, Madras photo Biennale was held there. So if some public events are held there, it gives the public an opportunity to go in and appreciate heritage as well. So that is something that, you know, one is happy about that it, it was restored well. Thanks to the efforts of heritage activists like Sujata Shankar and many others, there has been an increased interest and proactive participation by the city's residents in the conservation of its heritage over the last few years. While interest in the built and cultural heritage of Chennai is seeing a revival, it is the city's ecological heritage, its biodiversity, that remains under threat and affects the daily lives of the people. Almost every year, parts of Chennai get flooded during monsoon, with the severity of floods increasing year by year. An important reason is the rampant urbanization and destruction of the wetlands in Chennai. According to the data available with the government of Tamil Nadu, Chennai city has lost 60% of its wetlands between 1980 and 2010. So what is a wetland? Wetlands are areas where water covers the soil or is present either at or near the surface of the soil for large parts of the year. Mangroves, creeks, estuaries and lakes are all categorized as wetlands. In 1971, India signed an international treaty known as the Convention on Wetlands in the city of Ramsar in Iran. Under this treaty, Iran has declared 49 wetlands as Ramsar sites governed by the framework of this convention. Sadly, none of the wetlands in Chennai are protected under the Ramsar Convention, although in February 2022, the government of Tamil Nadu sent a proposal to the central government to declare the Palli Karanai marshland in Chennai as a Ramsar site. Dr. Jayashri Vikatesan, a social scientist and a managing trustee of the Care Earth Trust, has been working to protect Chennai's biodiversity for the last two decades. She shared with us perspectives on the importance of Chennai's wetlands and the threats that they face. Yeah, basically, as you are all probably aware, Chennai is a coastal city. It's uh, on the coast of the Bay of Bengal. It's a very warm sea. So naturally, it's a very flat area. And given the fact that it's very flat, uh, water is a very critical factor because you know whatever monsoon we get, which is limited to a window between October and December, the northeast monsoon, that actually as it falls on the land, it rapidly gushes towards the sea. So naturally, the city is so organized that you have three kinds of wetlands: the ones that are on the coast, which are natural, then those in between the coast and the hinterland, which are semi-natural, and in the hinterland you have the man-made wetlands. These are very important, not just to handle the monsoon, but also to make sure water is made available for other purposes, irrigation, water, a whole lot of things, potable water, other kinds of use of water, for all this. But what is often overlooked is the fact that these wetlands, at least as far as Chennai is concerned, given the fact it's a coastal city, are the biggest flood mitigation areas. This is the importance of wetlands to the city of Chennai. The biggest challenge these wetlands face is that of urbanization. In the last three decades, vast stretches of mangroves, creeks, riverbanks, and other areas have been redesignated as urban areas or industrial areas. 
For example, the Ennore wetlands in North Chennai are extremely important for the ecological balance of the city. But since 2015, more than 667 acres of these wetlands have been lost to set up central and state government public sector units such as an ash dump for BPCL and the Ennore port. Thanks to such extensive destruction of wetlands in Chennai, areas which once served as a natural draining ground for excess water have been plagued with floods. Flooding, water logging is not recent in Chennai. 2005 is the year that everybody woke up to the fact that the city gets flooded. But historically, if you look at it, from the late 1700s, there have been records of decadent flooding. Every decade, almost like clockwork, Chennai city gets water log flood, flooded. But 2005, it hit all those areas which were otherwise considered as very insular, you know, areas which are flood proof. New areas got affected, so there was a lot of recognition. And following that, there is a greater awareness both within the communities as well as the government about flooding and the impact of it on the city. But I should also say there's a lot of fear. It's a kind of an awareness combined with fear. But uh, if you ask me whether this awareness has, has led to some kind of a positive action, the answer is a mixed bag. For instance, many of the areas that have been recently developed, at least post-1991, are areas that were hitherto wetlands. And these are not encroachments. These were developed based on a government ruling that these areas could be declassified as wetland buffers and converted into habitations. So sometimes when you're talking to people about awareness, about action for wetland conservation, you're actually directly asking them to move away from that place, which is not something anybody would like to welcome. But Studies post-2005, some of which I have led myself, have shown that there is a direct correlation between wetland loss and flooding in Chennai. But Chennai city alone has lost 65% of its wetland area. So you have lesser area to hold the water that comes in during the northeast monsoon. But there also have been successes, the most notable example being the Pallikaranai Marsh in South Chennai. We've had one success that's something that the entire country can actually celebrate, not just coming out of Chennai city, which is a wetland which was designated as a wasteland. This, this is something that I worked upon along with my colleagues. We've been able to reclassify that area and have it protected. So originally this area was about 6,000 hectares. And over a period of 30 years, 90% of the area was lost. So when we began work on that in 2002, only 600 hectares was left remaining as a wetland. And even those 600 hectares had been partitioned or allotted to a number of government agencies. Large, beautiful tract area, very rich in terms of biodiversity. So based on some studies and the kind of follow-up that we did, the kind of engagement we embarked upon with the government and with communities, today we've been able to protect 720 hectares of that marsh. And in fact, it's been now cited as a potential candidate for Ramsar certification and the application has been given. This is a big success. And all with absolutely no major funding, no external agency presence, is totally in situ. So that's a case that I think it's worth emulating or talking about. The marsh is called the Pallikarna Marsh. However, there is a sense of apathy among local residents to the city's rich biodiversity and a long way to go before citizens get involved in the conservation of Chennai's wetlands. I would say that Chennai city, somehow, I, I really don't know the reason for this. The citizens are not greatly appreciative of the local biodiversity. Whenever you talk of biodiversity, people seem to think that it exists only in other cities or other wilderness areas. And most people don't recognize that there is wilderness in their own backyards. So that needs to be worked upon. And I think a lot of people have already started working on it. At least colleges have started working on it. Some major groups, people like Intac and others have started working on it. I would say we need to wait for at least a decade before people can actually truly appreciate that they're living in the midst of a beautiful place and that needs to be protected. And I think the next decade, we should all devote ourselves to building that kind of awareness and understanding of the biodiversity. The pressures of urbanization on Chennai's built as well as natural heritage will continue to grow. There will be successes and failures. How the city navigates this balance between the old and the new remains to be seen.